Ladies and gentlemen, in this Red Gaming Tetacom video, we're going to be discussing graphics card specs. A week or two ago, I put out a video going through the basics of how CPUs function, and by popular request, we're back and we're looking at graphics cards. In this video, we're going to be focusing on the pure basics. Namely, what different specs and terminologies mean for graphics cards. That way, in a successive video, we can jump into the breach with the technical jargon right out the gate. So, let's start with the very basics. What is a graphics card and what does it do inside the computer? Video cards produce the graphical images inside the machine, and they do this by being issued instructions, commands if you will, from the system's main processor and then executing those commands. <laughs> Simplified examples of instructions might be something like, draw this box, now stick a texture on it. Graphics cards are capable of doing so much more though than just handling graphics, including compute workloads, which are complex mathematical equations. These may be useful in games for, say, physics or lighting, or for dedicated applications such as Bitcoin or folding at home. It's imperative to understand the difference between what a video card and an actual GPU is. While many folks, including myself quite often, use the terms interchangeably, there is actually a distinctive difference. A video slash graphics card is literally the entire dedicated device which plugs inside your computer. You may call a GTX 1080 a video card or an RX 480. The name refers to the product, the memory, the cooler, the chip itself, the shroud, everything. The GPU, graphics processing unit, is literally just the res chip residing on the PCB. To give you an example, the GTX 1080 and 1070 both use the exact same GPU on chip, which is the GP104, but the GT1070 has parts disabled, cut down, to fit to the lower product here. AMD, AMD excuse me, do the same with the Polaris 10 GPU, which is found in both the 480 and the 470, respectively. Multiple graphics cards can also be placed inside a system, thanks to either AMD's Crossfire or NVIDIA's SLI. It's slightly outside the scope of this video to go in-depth on how this works or performance, but do note that benefits will vary on a game-by-game -game basis, and a lot of stuff may change with DirectX 12 over the coming years because of its multi-adapt tweaks. Another common question, what is a graphics architecture? In a nutshell, it is the platform and technology used to build the particular chip in question. Typically, this changes every one to two years as NVIDIA and AMD release new iterations of their hardware. For example, NVIDIA went from Maxwell to Pascal, but new features architectures bring over from the predecessor designs, they might be faster clock speeds, more efficient designs, or perhaps the process which they are built on shrunk. To put that another way, the process is the size of the silicon, the and reducing it allows more transistors to be packed into the same space as the older process. What about memory? Memory size is a simpler one to explain. It's the amount of space the hardware has to hold data. For example, a 4GB card can hold twice the amount of data, in theory, as a 2GB model. As of recording this at the dawn of 2017, 4GB is really the minimum needed for 1080p, and you're starting to game in higher resolutions, 40, 40, 1440p excuse me, or more, then 6 gigabytes or more is what you're probably going to be seeking. Unfortunately, memory is a little more complex than simply how much data a card can hold. Bandwidth is just as important. Higher amounts of bandwidth means data can travel around the cards at faster rates. This is a product of the bus, of the bus width, how many bits can travel per clock cycle. Think of width as, say, a tube times the clock speed. And there are also many different types of memory. Discussing them here would really start pushing outside the basics, but the most common now is GDDR5, GDDR5X, and finally high bandwidth memory, with HBM2 cards coming out soon. R5X is very similar to R5, but sports much higher speeds, and high bandwidth memory is vertically stacked memory, which does run at much lower speeds compared to GDDR5 or R5X, but has a much wider width of bus. For example, 1024 bit for just one stack of HBM1. This allows lower power consumption and higher bandwidth compared to the more traditional memory. Core clocks is something that is 
the speed of the GPU and it is measured in Hertz or clock rate. It is simply means the number of clock cycles being executed. But much like a computer's CPU, clock speed isn't the best indicator of performance across different architectures. For example, if you were to somehow overclock the act of running, by the way, a piece of hardware above its intended frequency, the older generation GTX 680 against the same clock as the GTX 1080, good luck with that, but let's pretend you could, the various improvements in Pascal's architecture would still mean there's no competition. Pascal would butcher the older card. Boost clocks, meanwhile, refer to the GPU's clock speed when the card is under load, in other words, being stressed. The clock speed might raise or lower dynamically based upon heat and power consumption, with the GPU doing its best to balance performance with reliability. Okay, I think we're doing pretty well here. So what about CUDA? What about DirectX 12, Vulkan and so on? Well, CUDA is NVIDIA's own programming language and it stands for Compute Unified Device Architecture. It's not just popular with games developers, but also for folks who want to do scientific research or write applications to process data. For example, video editing. CUDA cores, meanwhile, are the number of physical cores inside a graphics card. We'll get to that in a moment. AMD use OpenCL for its programming language, and AMD also tends to allow developers the ability to rewrite its code, compared to NVIDIA's more black box approach. AMD refers to its processor cores as stream processors. Unlike a CPU, which has, say, 2, 4, 8, or even 16 cores, GPUs feature hundreds, if not thousands. A 1080, a GTX 1080, has 2560. An RX 480 contains 2,304, and some cards actually have 4,000 plus. These cores are a lot simpler, with less control circuitry, for example, than traditional CPU cores, but they have great power in numbers, and excel in parallel processing. But we'll have to delve more into that in part two. Talking about appies for a moment, Vulkan and DirectX 12 are both appies, or application programming interfaces. Their job is to translate instructions from the games to the graphics card drivers. This tells the graphics card how to do a specific task. Now we have put out numerous videos on DirectX 12 and Vulkan, including, may I add, an exclusive interview with Kronos Group, who are the keepers of Vulkan. But essentially, essentially these two modern appies handle things in a much more modern way compared to the predecessors, which were OpenGL, which was the predecessor for Vulkan, and DirectX 11, which of course predates DirectX 12. They are both better at multitasking, allowing developers to code to the metal, directly, in other words, accessing GPU functions in a much more console-like console manner, and better able to use compute. And this is just a few improvements. There are a myriad more which we have discussed, but just somewhat fall outside the remit of this video. PCIe, also known as Peripheral Component Interconnect Express, is a high-speed serial connection, or expansion slot, which allows people to simply plug in a piece of hardware into their PCs. Modern PCs will have multiple types or multiple PCIe slots, including a full-length PCIe, which is for, typically for graphics, and a mini connection. Minis are not used for graphics, so we're just going to focus on the full-length interface. As of early 2017, PCIe 3.0 is still the standard, with PCIe 4 threatening to replace it by early 2018. For a PCIe 3.0 times 16 slot, you are provided a total bandwidth of 16 gigabytes per second, and this standard will double by P with uh, the release of PCIe 4.0. So that's about it. We've gone over the very basics of the different parts and specs of a graphics card. In the next video, the one I suspect many of you will want to watch, we'll delve into more complex topics. Now I know some people are in the comments are going to say, yes, well, you know, you didn't really go super in depth into a particular thing. And yes, this was to give people an overview of what something does. I don't want to go super in depth and technical into it because I just want people to understand the gist of it. And then we can start delving into what is CUDA, what are stream processors, what, you know, how does bandwidth get calculated? And we can also, of course, 
start looking into just you know how do GPUs function as a subject matter which I think is much better to get all on to a solid footing for those subjects. Anyway, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.